Welcome, everyone. It's great to see such a full room. So uh, we have a good amount of time to cover a topic that I'm sure we're all interested in discovering more about. Um, this year is a very important year for those who want to bring together the food and cannabis uh, world. So we will go through a range of questions, and then we'll leave some time as well for a Q&A at the end. So uh, we'll just save the time at the end for that. In about five, 10 minutes, we'll see how things go. Um, and we have a really great panel to discuss um, the subject, which the next frontier in food innovation, cannabis, is a food ingredient. I'll briefly introduce myself, and then we'll go across the, the panel, and they can introduce themselves. My name is Mark Juhas. I'm Director of Market Insights and Analytics at Hexo. Uh, and been working in the food and beverage space for many years. Uh, we have um, some uh, great uh, topics to cover, but I will go to the rest of the panel and, and have them introduce themselves. All right. Hello. Oh, it works. Good afternoon. I'm Sylvain Chalabois from Dalhousie University. I'm director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab. Good afternoon. I'm Trina Farr. I'm a food scientist and product developer responsible for edibles uh, development at Hexo. Um, I know that a lot of you are thinking about what is this industry, it's the Wild West, and really in the food space, I would say that this is the part where it's really exciting to be innovating, so thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Pierre Colline, I'm with Hexo. I work in the business development team. Uh, I have 20 months of experience in the cannabis industry, so that makes me a veteran in this business. <laughs> It's been a really exciting 20 months. Um, really happy to be here today. I'm Michael McKenzie. I'm the founder of the Seeds of Sausage Corporation. We just do uh, manufacturing of higher end uh, meat products for restaurants throughout Ontario and Canada. Great. So thank you everybody for being here and thank you to the panel. I'm really uh, looking forward to it. So. We're here at a food conference, so of course there's people coming from around the world, from across Canada, from across Ontario, um, to look at food. And, and we also know that the cannabis industry in Canada is now you know, half a year or so old, uh, but what we're having here is a, an opportunity to bring two worlds together, if you will, in the edibles and food and beverages space. So the first question I'd like to ask, and maybe start it off with uh, Sylvain, your perspective on it. What is the unique market opportunity here for cannabis-infused edibles and beverage? Like, what, what, what is unique there about that? Uh, well, it is unique because Canada became uh, the first industrialized country in the world to legalize uh, cannabis last fall, October 2018, after Uruguay. And so the focus has been on, uh, on, on edibles since then, I would say. Health Canada actually presented its regulatory framework on December 20th of 2018. There were two months of consultations. Uh, since then, we haven't heard much from Health Canada, but we are expecting that amendment to be approved by Parliament before uh, the session ends in June, and which would make edibles legal by October. That's what we expect, four days before our own federal election, yeah. interestingly. <laughs> Uh, so, obviously, since then, we've seen a slew of announcements, uh, including uh, announcement from EXO about partnerships uh, with the beverage industry. Uh, we've seen a lot of movement in beverage in particular, I would say. In snacking, I would say, based on a project that uh, we uh, conducted with NSF, and I see some NSF people in the room, uh, we surveyed uh, we surveyed some uh, some CEOs uh, in Canada about the cannabis space and on snacking I would say overall a lot of companies are just staying on the sideline and and, and they're going to assess the situation as it evolves. Thank you. Thank you. Trina, would you want to add to that? Yeah, I would also say we've done some uh, qualitative research with consumers, and really it's the growth and bringing new people into the industry. So edibles is a unique uh, cannabis experience, different from inhalation. So it actually is a different market that we'd be capturing as well. So that's the real um, part, and that's where I think a lot of people here are today, really, how do you capture that market? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, a question as well for, for the panel, uh, and maybe uh, Trina, you might want to um, start that off, is there's a lot of um, food companies here. Of course, Hexo, we want to be prominent in this for sure. 
Um, what will brand leadership and innovation look like, whether it's education or building trust or having a unique, unmet, um, you know, un new product on the marketplace? What, what do you think that will look like from for our point of view? Well, there's some challenges with edibles, and I think a lot of people understand that dosage is one of the um, biggest um, concerns for consumers, variability and inconsistency in the products that they have today. So this is the black or gray market that we're talking about. So a lot of the edible experience that people have had has been inconsistent. And then if you also think about the onset and offset of the cannabinoids into the system, those vary, depend on what you ate in the morning, what you ate today, what you ate before, what you ate after, and also what you um, consumed with the cannabinoids. So um, those are really the, the challenges. Um, the opportunity area for uh, edibles is um, that it's really discreet, it's portable, um, it's indulgent. So a lot of the food products today that are in the market in the U.S. are really focusing on that indulgent side. So um, those are, you know, what what the hurdles are and what the opportunities are, and being able to marry those two things together um, and really focus on it from a CPG perspective on how to be able to develop and, and guide in that area. You know, at Hexo, our goal is to be responsible. Um, that is one of the things that we are ensuring in our product development process as well as our dosage. Um, consistency will happen uh, when legalization happens and, you know, uh, companies start um, pushing out in this space. But I would say uh, the Hexo model model is really about going uh, low and slow, as well as having data and back um, clinical data to support what we're doing. So that really is where people are going to win in, in, in the innovation. EXO is going low and slow. How many, how many people have you hired in the last six months? <laughs> Mark, can I chime in on this? Please. Um, I think if you're in the food industry and you look at uh, the rules and regulations governing uh, your participation in the cannabis industry. Uh, a lot of you might have uh, second guesses or be spooked by this. Uh, so to, you sort of you're you're in this forest and you're just looking at the trees. But if you step back a bit, I think there's a significant opportunity uh, for uh, the food industry and specifically for brands as we get ready to enter this third wave of the the cannabis industry. And the reason I say this is that. Uh, when you think about it, we are very limited in how we can brand, promote, and market our products. And so we're also dealing with, uh, in many respects, uh, a new consumer that's, that would not have, you know, 15% of Canadians currently consume cannabis. So this is about the new consumer journey. So when you think about a new consumer going into a cannabis retailer, um, they're going to be, in a sense, bombarded with a whole bunch of brands and products that they know nothing about. Yeah. Uh, if all of a sudden uh, a big brand is there that they're comfortable with, you think of the roles that brands play from a consumer awareness perspective, from a trust perspective. I think there's a significant opportunity for established brands in Canada, in the United States, to play a real leadership role in this nascent industry. So good news, not bad news. Thank you, Pierre. And knowing uh, your work with the regulatory side um, and for the panel at large, um, if some in the audience may know this quite well and some may not, but you know, there is going to be a whole range of regulations, whether it's around marketing and advertising, uh, dosage size, uh, labeling. Is there uh, any particularly, uh, Pierre, that you think will be important for food companies or ca uh, CPG companies in terms of the regula regulation side that will be like the most important to sort of help navigate through? Does any, uh, that's going to take like an hour and a half, Mark. But um, unfortunately, there are a lot of rules. I, I think uh, the big requirement is you need a license. So you need a cannabis processing license in order to be able to put cannabis into food or uh, topicals or the, you know whatever you want to put cannabis into. So and you need a separate facility. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that's it, just Sylvain, getting the license alone is no mean feat. Um, I think it requires a lot of expertise. It's certainly a very capital intensive process because you're building a facility, you're developing uh, the standards and the rules and the procedures governing the operation of that facility before you've ever produced a product and sold it. So there's a capital investment that's required. There's the separate facility investment that Sylvain mentioned. Um, and I'll talk one more in terms of sort of rules I think that, that you might be thinking of in terms of entering our business. Um, let's go. <laughs> uh, 
This is part of my act. <laughs> I'm trying to get people to trust. If me. I can jump in while Pierre looks at his as notes, uh, I mean, basically, if you've if you've kept note about what's been happening in Health Canada, they they literally looked at Colorado as a case study, and they came back with a risk off attitude, and that's basically what we got back in December. Uh, the industry is concerned, and rightly so. I think the framework is quite, quite strict, a little too strict as far as I'm concerned, discouraging many businesses to look at edibles as a potent market. And that's why just recently, two weeks ago, there's a new alliance uh, that was created. A What's the name of the alliance? I think it's Cannabis Beverage uh, Producer, Cannabis Beverage Producers Alliance. Brian's uh, nodding at the back. Yes. So. Yeah, so... So anyways, that alliance will actually lobby the government to, to look into uh, things that Pierre is mentioning right now. Uh, another one I think, and I always look at uh, opportunities, um, not obstacles. Uh, there are no limits on CBD in uh, cannabis uh, edibles. So we're capped at 10 milligrams per edible or per unique container. But it will come, when it comes to CBD, and, and what we're really talking about here is a, a wellness product. What's the term you use, Mike? Run around functional food. So this could be the next big functional food that's going to come in to the food industry. And, and that's, I did research on the way in here. I've got a note on that. It's, a, it's projected to be a $220 billion a year business in, by 2025. So that's big business. And that's a, a great opportunity. And crystal balling this, I, I do foresee eventually that the regulator, especially when you look at the international developments with respect to the descheduling of CBD at the World Health Organization level, the UN level, and then what's happening in the United States with hemp-based CBD. I really do foresee a time when you know CBD will be taken out of the, the cannabis framework and or the restrictions will be loosened that will allow CBD to become much more of a consumer product. By the way, Pierre, if, if our numbers are correct at Dalhousie, 70% of the room wouldn't even know what cannab cannabinoids are or what CBD is. So maybe you want to explain a little bit? Oh, you're the... <laughs> the one with the PhD in the room said, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, I thought you were the expert. You're in that business. Sure. Well, there's, I mean, cannabinoids, uh, we're actually releasing a new study next week on stigma and, and knowledge, uh, cane knowledge around cannabinoids in general. And it's very low. I mean, we are cannabinoids illiterate, if I may say so. Uh, there's THC and there's CBD. And THC has received a lot of attention uh, since the new government has come in uh, in uh, October of 2015, uh, and it talked about legalizing cannabis. Uh, most people think of cannabis, uh, when they think of cannabis, they think about getting high. And that's not the case uh, with CBD, with, to, to Pierre's point. CBD, as far as I'm concerned, will, will probably be the one cannabinoid that will interest the food industry the most over time because of its virtues around uh, relieving anxiety, um, pain, and things like that. Those are things that uh, could make cannabi cannabis a, a super ingredient. Thank you. Um, Mike, um, as, as those of you who don't know Seat to Sausage, check it out. Um, a great company. Um, you must have so much experience in getting uh, the company up to getting products ready for, you know, getting to grocery stores or wherever. Um, that whole process from so supply source to quality assurance to, you know, inspections from Canadian Food, you know, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the whole building up of a product, the branding of it. Um, what do you see as sort of in the next couple of years in, in companies that are going to go into this cannabis infused space, things they need to be thinking of or else, you know, they may not make it or that, that those who become leaders in this space, knowing the whole food processing uh, pipeline? Yeah, so I, my, my interest really in this lies, and in the future lies in that sort of health, um, longevity, wellness, uh, have to come up with something new other than wellness. It's overused now. But um, so really that functional foods is what I'm super interested in. So what if I were to produce a pepperoni stick, for example, and then that pepperoni stick is high in your uh, magnesium, zinc, you know, you have different mushroom extracts. So you have a snack that then you can feed to families or children that actually, you know, gives them greater cognitive abilities, you know, sort of 
uh, gives your brain everything it needs to function better, as opposed to what you'd look at sports nutrition, I think sort of fills that category now. Um, but so that that evolution into the future is what I'm really interested in. And then when it comes to CBD and functional food, um, I have a, a huge interest in that. Um, so that's where, sort of in my you know direction of where I would see trends going, and I'd like to follow is uh, is directly in in that. Um, and then looking at CBD beverages that are currently available um, is a big one. Uh, it's the easiest one to, to to do at the moment, I think, uh, and make that available to a larger market. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. On the, on that last one though, too. On just on the last one, the barrier to entry to this is extremely high with the regulatory side having to have a completely separate facility just to produce a product that's not currently on the market and that you're looking depending on the product you're making you know in excess of 10 million um, to just get it up and going uh, so hugely challenging but I think you guys provide some options for that in the future for manufacturers I think as well too uh, a question about the consumer, and maybe Trina, if you would like to us uh, um, weigh in on this one, uh, the consumers. So we, we know that there are cannabis users already, generally in the form of inhaling, right? What we can buy now in OCS or in the retail stores that are beginning to emerge uh, across Canada, across Ontario. We know there are existing already cannabis users, but maybe this edible space will have a new consumer journey. There will be the various products and beverages that will come out. So what might that consumer journey look like to build that trust? to find those new consumers and open up the, the, the market to a whole new segment? So some of the research that we've done shows that most people, um, their experience with cannabis, cannabinoids occurred um, between the age of 12 and 16 years old. And I know if you're a parent in the room, you're probably shocked by that. But most of those occurrences happened through inhalation. And most of those experiences were not very favorable. Um, so that's where people's journey first starts. And as they age or evolve or their social situation changes, um, we've, we have some study and research that shows that um, the social factor around uh, inhalation versus edibles is very similar from an experience point of view, but very different from a socialization point of view. So in, inhalation um, has a very, um, you know, uh, almost like... A, a forum where people would pass a joint around and there, there's a little bit of a social culture on that. For edibles, you're taking a chocolate bar and you're breaking the pieces off of that. So it's the experience of it, as you can um, understand, is very different. What we also find for edibles is, is that uh, for consumers that are mostly curious and had not tried a can cannabis in any form prior, um, generally those consumers are a bit older. So those are older consumers, you know, 30, 40, 50, let's call them older for the sake of this uh, discussion. Ouch. And <laughs> and they generally would, would uh, resort to edibles within some very comfortable people that they're very comfortable with. So it's not in a, you know, bar type of setting. It would be more at home with their spouse, uh, with a close friend. And really, they're, um, they're really thinking about just staying in for the night, right? This is just a calming thing. So the journey is very, it started very similar, but it evolved uh, very differently um, on, you know, people's experiences as well. And I think the opportunity really is, is when cannabis, um, edible cannabis legalizes on in October, is that that new consumer, the curious 30, 40, 50 year olds who hadn't tried it. So the other 85% of the population may, and I use the word may, go to the OCS or websites and then be able to um, have that experience and feel very comfortable that what is being sold in these um, stores is being regulated. So there, it's not a, you know, my friend bake some brownies and gave you a piece and you fall over in a party. This is very regulated. And that's one of the things that the industry is very concerned about. So back in October of 2017, we conducted a survey on, on, uh, on perception, uh, asking Canadians whether or not they were favorable um, with the legalization of cannabis. 68% of Canadians were, uh, were in favor of legalizing cannabis. Now, it, was, it wasn't legalized then, so that was October 2017. Of the 68%, 93% were willing to try an edible product once legalized. So next week, we're releasing a new study. 
And I'm just asking the room here, uh, what do you think the needle is shifting here? Are people more willing to try edibles since, legalize, since cannabis is legalized or less? It's less. Something's going on. Uh, we don't know exactly yet, but we do suspect that there's, 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 there's work to be done around uh, education, uh, what cannabinoids are. Uh, and the CBD issue, I think, is a huge one. It's misunderstood. And of course, the effects we've all, all, all we've heard uh, of about edibles are horror stories. There was a five year old kid in Nova Scotia who was hospitalized and just a uh, cannabis infused chocolate bar. So those those stories get a lot of traction and attention and it, it makes it's it seems to it appears that Canadians are more concerned now than two years ago, even if cannabis is legal now. Do you want to yeah, Mike? On on that, I think like part part of the issue I see with that Currently, when I look at, you know, quality of products available in the market today and just sort of like that quality control aspect, um, there doesn't seem to be much quality control in a lot of the manufacturing that I see in the Canadian market today or virtually no regulation either. You have products with, you know, zero milligrams of CBD or THC to products that, you know, are just yeah. should not be sold at all. Um, and then consistency of what you're going to get out of that, I think... I'm really waiting to see when, when all the regulations are passed and everything's legal, the products that come out and the quality of those, I think, are going to skyrocket and it'll be a totally different world. But of course, it's getting a, a bad reputation currently because yeah. th there's is, is, is a super gray area, I think. There's, there's a question I want to ask the panel at large. And, you know, whether, from the inhal inhalables point of view, maybe... Um, Often the marketing that is allowed after age gating is, is maybe to millennials or the 30-somethings, the 20-somethings. Is there, from the point of view of what we're talking about, um, a hidden or a less obvious demographic, whether it's age, uh, gender, ethnicity, that could be a, 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 a really good opportunity to be targeting a demographic for food products that might meet their needs, whether it's from a health point of view or what have you? Is there, is there a demographic that might be there to should be tapping into? In, in my perspective, I think it's the baby boomers. So the ones that, you know, enjoyed cannabis maybe in the 70s, now they have some uh, medical ailments that they're trying to address, and it's a non-traditional way. And I would say um, the people that ask me the most questions are my parents' friends. Um, so I would say that's a, a generation that's looking for pain relief, um, you know, a lot of uh, the health issues that develop with aging, and I think that that is a huge opportunity for people to look at. Yeah. I, I'd say, I mean, the question, I'll answer your question with another question. I mean, the, the way I see this is how or when will cannabis become socially normalized? And I, so we just did a a couple of surveys a few, over two, three years, and uh, the needle is not moving still. So I'd say that we're at least, like plant-based dieting right now, mm. being vegan now is socially normalized. It happened. It's happening now. Yeah. So when I look at cannabis, when will we reach that tipping point? I, I just don't know, but it's not, I, I don't see it uh, before 2020 at the very least. Yeah. So here, here's another question, maybe a big question, uh, is what will a leading brand like Hexor, what will be the educational mix that the leading brand provides that will build that trust, that will be that messaging, that communications, the, what are the low-hanging uh, fruits of opportunity to build trust, to address stigma? How, how will that look? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's going to start with quality, and it's going to start with the consumer. There's so many limitations, and I'm stealing this one from our, the CEO of our joint venture, who's a, you know, a, a beer executive that's on an international scale. And he said, branding starts with the consumer. So I think the key to social acceptance, given the restrictions we're dealing with from a whole, like we can't sponsor this conference. We can't. We can give money to a hospital, but. They could never put our name on the hospital. So, given those kinds of restrictions, 
I think it's going to, you know, we're going to win this one consumer at a time. And I think the key to that and what's going to be so exciting for, you know, people in your industry is that quality is really going to matter. Like, trust me, we don't know how to make cookies or cakes or any, any kind of food. We have enough challenges, you know, trying to get a license and cultivate cannabis and get it to market. So significant opportunities uh, in terms of quality and the consumer. And you're the experts in that. I'll... Since I'm the academic on the on the panel, I can say whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> I don't represent a publicly traded company. Uh, I'd say that we need to have a a discussion on. We haven't really had a discussion. We just we just saw Parliament uh, approving this, and and now of course we have stores and everything else. It, it kind of happened, and uh, there's still some people not comfortable with this, but. I actually will expect companies to breach regulations from time to time on advertising, for example. Actually, we're already seeing yes, it. Yes, that's happening. It's happening already. Yep. Companies testing limits uh, because really limits are quite significant. And I suspect that some companies will do it on purpose just to have that conversation. Uh, in courts, maybe, but we'll have that conversation. And people will start saying, okay, so why do we, over, over time, people will start saying, okay, so why can't we sponsor this while alcohol is fine and alcohol can kill people? Cannabis cannot kill compared to alcohol. Yeah. So, so our relationship with cannabis at times can be a little bit irrational. And so to rationalize all that, I think will we'll probably require some companies to really test the limits of our regulation, regulatory regime. Well, one of the things that, um, for Hexo specifically is that we, we recognize that the science is new and we are um, investing a lot of time in research on clinical data to help support these. And so by, you know, the question is how, how do we, you know, get people confidence and it's with data. So. You know, we with data, we can help with that. We can also help with the stigma um, with that data. So it yeah. takes some time, as clinical research does. Um, but now that it's becoming legal, now we can find facets to do the clinical studies that in the past was unable to be done. That's a huge point. <laughs> I'm a researcher. And when I look at the Health Canada's uh, regulatory framework, it's based on what science, mm. you know? It's coming out of nowhere because we don't know much about the drug in the first place. So absolutely, Trina, you make a really important point. We'll know, allowing uh, cannabis to become legalized will allow us to know more about it. A question about Canada and the world. So we're at an international conference. Of course, we're here in Toronto. We're here in Canada. Canada has sort of uh, set itself you know, as a, as a major uh, G7 country to legalize cannabis. Some are saying that we're now getting that runway. Of course, it's been legal in, in parts of the states, Colorado for five years, California, the West Coast, uh, Uruguay, a smaller country. But from the point of view of our experience as a country, as, 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 as food business leaders, um, you know, big companies in the South, in, you know, United States, what will um, Canadian companies need to be aware of in terms of scale, in terms of mergers and acquisitions, in surviving in what may likely become a competitive space, whether it's thinking about Europe, thinking about other parts of the world. I'll go. Uh, yeah, why don't you go first, Pierre? Yeah. So I think this is a unique, uh, this is our moment in the sun. Uh, this is a chance for, uh, for you, for the food industry in Canada to be uh, the leader in this new emerging global industry. There are, uh, I think, 100, there's 70 countries in the world where medical cannabis is legal, representing over 700 million people. So this is a trend. There's something going on here. And given the rules and regulations prohibiting uh, big company involvement in cannabis in the United States, I would argue that Canada de facto becomes the R&D center for this new industry. So. To me, this is a real opportunity. This is I, I liken this to like last time we were a, a leader in an industry was the fur trade. You know, we've got a real yeah. chance here to to, to do something dynamic. Yeah. So it, it and to one of the messages that Hexo as a company puts out there is that we're you know come to Canada, work with us, get it right, get the right product mix, understand what consumers want, and get ready for the global 
cannabis economy? <laughs> Yay. Um, <laughs> this is the way I see it. So domestically, uh, like typically in food, you see industry driving change and policy just follows, catches up. Catches up. With cannabis, it was the other way around, mm -hmm. domestically. Internationally, Pierre is right. What's going to drive growth are companies looking abroad, uh, giving Canada a leadership role. I think that's the intent. I think Parliament had that idea. They, ju they just, I don't think the government knows how to do it, but who's going to do it are companies like uh, EXO and others that, uh, that are on board. I mean, I, I've talked to quite a few cannabis companies. They're all overseas, yeah. <laughs> like very actively. And Hexo too. I didn't want to say that. But <laughs> yeah. Maybe I, I looking at the time to give uh, a healthy dose of uh, Q and A from the audience as well. But maybe just uh, a couple of closing thoughts um, from starting with you, Mike. What is what's the opportunity? What is that excites you about this new prospect that we have to bring edibles, cannabis edibles, to the front? Selling lots of uh, salami. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, well, I think it's just an exciting industry in general, and there's so much opportunity. And it, like you said, the market is, is so large, and it doesn't currently exist. So sort of being on that ground floor, seeing something grow and helping be able to, to create that and shape it is amazing. And with what you guys were saying, you know, Canada forming that framework for the world of what it's going to look like, I think that's an, entirely the case. Um, I think it's fascinating. And I, I just want to, I, I just wish there were more things already created out there that, that we could use as a template, but it's all new, so it's uh, the, the world's the oyster, right? Mm. Yeah, um, happy to take questions. In some respects, you're, you're probably sitting here going, you know, we're outsiders trying to get in. And when you think about that, you know, like we were the outsiders for 100 years. We were so outside, most of us were, in, you know, in penal institutions. So uh, if I was going to give you any advice is, you know, your companies, your professionals, uh, talk to your politicians, talk to your legislators, say you want in this business. Like Sylvain's point is right. The policy got ahead of the practice. It's time for the practice to catch up with the policy. And if that's going to happen, you know, they're not going <coughs> to reluctant to listen to us, but your legislators will listen to you, your business people. Happy to help. One of the things I see is um, the amount of growth and um, employment that it's created. So this is maybe not why you're here today for this, but I would say it's really revitalized a lot of small communities, specifically in the horticultural area, as well as in the food industry. So um, Dr. Sylvain's done a study on this to show that CPG is dying in, let's call it Canada, and um, this is an area that really is um, creating a lot of employment and mm -hmm. it's allowing people to do some research that we haven't been able to do because of funding and time etc and so I, I think it's an exciting time I think that if you're at all interested in it to keep pushing that interest because you never know what unfolds next yeah but processing needs help yes and mm -hmm. cannabis provides hope mm -hmm. uh, that's that's how I see it uh, I mean if you're an investor in cannabis of course you the markets are just all over the place. It's very volatile. Let's let's admit it. Uh, but things will calm down, and the market will will adopt this new reality uh, over time. It won't happen tomorrow, but I would I do see over time things calming down and become way more stable. And as the regulatory framework becomes a little bit more loose, I would say. Uh, it will give a chance for processing uh, or companies to innovate even more. Because mm. right now, there's just little room to innovate on anything. Great. Um, questions, please. Yes, up here. Yeah. I, I actually have an answer. In our survey that we're publishing next week, I actually have a specific answer, but I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, it's because we had a few options. I just don't, I have my deck in, on my computer. I can give you the answer after this. I, ballpark, it's anywhere between 18 to 20 percent. Ballpark, okay? So there's therapeutic, med medicinal, there's different reasons. 
I can I can show you the graph if you want. So sorry, I don't have the all the numbers off the top of my head. Yep, go ahead. That's a great question. Uh, one of the great things about uh, Canada is we have a is federalism. So we're in a sense going to have ten different approaches to retail cannabis. Yeah. So in our province here in in Ontario, I think what's going to get really exciting is that uh, the government is going to open up or has opened up uh, retail to the private sector, allowing entrepreneurs to specialize or to to get into this industry. So I would foresee. Uh, a cannabis retailer focusing uniquely on beverages or a cannabis retailer focusing uniquely on, um, you know, shelf-stable cannabis edibles. I, I could see that happening. Um, food culture is huge, so I think there's a corollary there. Uh, and I think um, crystal balling it, you know, what we would foresee, and I think what you're going to see rapidly happen in the United States, is you're going to see uh, CBD foods become available at your local uh, your local. Uh, you know, 7-Eleven. So this, this is coming. And that's, and I think once we see these things happening in the United States, it's going to really force yeah. legislators up here to start to rethink their approach to. So I think CBD at a retail level coming soon. I think THC edibles, you'll, you, you're going to see some stores that are also going to specialize in those things. And I think your question opens up a, a bigger one too, and that is, you know, where can, where, where can you creatively have these products once there's that trust level. You know, if you look in Colorado, you can get it at a bar. There are like drinks that are infused and you could go to a bar. Restaurants may have it one day. Um, there are restrictions as well, what we have currently, such as I think you can't have a refrigerated or a frozen product. So that has certain dynamics on where the products can be sold for now. But I think that, you know, certain waves of lobbying or, you know, reform of the regulations might open up a whole different spectrum of retail opportunities. One thing that uh, hello, the one thing that uh, I didn't expect, as my I, I come from Quebec. What's going on in Quebec? Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, because uh, you're talking about you know muffins being sold at retail and, and cannabis infused products. Well, I think the last place in Canada where it's going to happen is Quebec. The, for some reason, so the legal age is about to become 21 in Quebec. There's a there's a bill. Uh, and on top, and when it comes to distribution, so far, on the dry side, it's been so risk off uh, in Quebec. It's unbelievable. So if you live in Quebec, you're gonna, if you're expecting, you know, Tim Hortons to sell that cannabis infused muffin, you're gonna have to wait a while. Is there a question at the back? Yeah. Uh, so the question posed was very general. The, there was no, uh, in terms of, we didn't actually evaluate um, uh, uh, any fiscal uh, incentives or anything like that. We just asked whether or not it was a good idea as a country. And then we dove into the edible. Uh, so our focus was very much on edibles in particular. Wanting to know if whether people wanted to try or not. Um, Interestingly, I don't know if Trina, your numbers uh, match ours, but uh, more women are inclined to try edibles than men. Have you seen that? Yep. Yeah, more more women because the inhalation target market really is males, um, so they've kind of take over that space. But yeah, it's women. And on on that question though, so women are consuming more edibles. What types of edibles are they consuming? Because that's a really broad sort of. So they're interested in consuming, um, not that they're consuming it today because it's not legalized. So um, it's more that they would, it, when it becomes legalized, they will consume it or are curious enough to purchase it. So it's not it. gummy bears or beverages. You don't have it pepperoni sticks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, also that we were, what we found out is uh, is that people do cook at home with right. with cannabis. So we uh, believe that 9.4% of Canadians actually cook uh, with cannabis, uh, not on a regular basis, but at least once a month. So that's so. There's another market there, uh, and frankly, I'm a little bit concerned because if you don't know what you're doing, you can get into trouble pretty quickly. And 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 Health Canada doesn't seem to really be overly concerned about that. I haven't seen any movement there either. So, But that's that's quite a lot. Yes, question here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so today um, the regulation won't allow you to have alcohol and cannabis. So it has to be a cannabis-infused beverage, okay? So you can't have a cider, a beer with cannabis addition. It cannot, they cannot be together. So that's the way the regulation reads for October. So the cannabis-infused beverages that will launch in October will not have alcohol in them. It's a little can. confusing because it's alcohol companies that are buying these businesses, so you're thinking that. But in fact, those those are not going to meet regulations. And you won't be able to call it beer or wine yeah. or cider. The, the one thing uh, I met with the Ontario uh, uh, Grape Growers Association, uh, I think it was uh, six months ago, in your region, actually, in St. Catharines. And they were concerned about substitution. Um, substituting a alcohol drink, or alcoholic drink, for a cannabis-infused uh, beverage. Uh, so in 2017, 26% of Canadians that actually uh, that do drink alcohol were willing to substitute their alcoholic drink for a cannabis-infused beverage. That has gone down since. And that, that's another phenomenon we're, we're, we're trying to explain. We don't know why, but it's gone down. So obviously it's, it's good news for wine, wine makers, but at the same time, there's, there's something else that probably may distort the data there. And from, from a manufacturing perspective, like for you to, to produce that beverage with you know, a THC or CBD in it, be incredibly easy compared to what you're doing now with cider or beer. So it's much easier to produce uh, cannabis-infused beverages than... You, you just need to have a whole different facility to do it now. Yeah, exactly. You should join this new organization, the Cannabis uh, Beverage Producers Alliance, and they, maybe they have a website up already. Yeah. I think we maybe could squeeze in one more question unless we get kicked out. Yeah. So the interesting thing about cannabinoids are is that they're oil soluble. So to get them to emulsify into a liquid, you need to either have um, uh, inter uh, emulsifier or nanotechnology, which takes the particles and breaks it down into very small points. Um, there are some discussions about efficacy as well as um, absorption on nanotechnology. Um, Really, at the end of the day, it, it needs some clinical studies and research to validate th those concerns. Um, Hexo is working on um, intellectual property to be able to um, emulsify or have the cannabinoids in both um, liquid oil-based as well as water-based and powder-based. So um, there's there are some other ways to do it, um, and that's what we're focused on. No pressure from the door. So is there any other question? Or if not, we could just, uh, yeah, go, Mike. I think I, I'm currently building a, a federally inspected processing plant for uh, mostly co-packing for, for other brands. But in there, in doing that, we really looked at um, that erosion of trust that the Canadian consumer has in food in Canada today and worldwide. And then we take a cue, or I want to take a cue from uh, manufacturing in China that you've seen where trust worldwide has been eroded within China. And then you look at new facilities in China being built and they're totally transparent. So you can walk in, you can see mid-production, have tours, but you do this from glass, you know, walled off areas. So you, you can actually see what's going on and increase your standard of production. So in our new facility, um, that's essentially what we're doing. You could walk through, see your production line. I have my super artisan sort of space uh, where we can make whatever we want, whenever we want, uh, with you know, uh, in-house lab um, to make sure everything's safe. But we, ha we do it all there, so it's super easy. But then you look at the larger side of manufacturing, and now we're talking about sort of 50,000 kilo production runs. Um, and what does this look like? And now we're no longer flexible and we can't pivot quickly, uh, especially in food, which is something we need to do. So 
uh, just ensuring um, that there is that transparency in manufacturing today. And I think that's what we see with new companies coming out or new builds coming out anywhere. You see this a, a common trend happening. And I think this is exactly the direction you guys are going in at the same time. That's a great question. Um, we have complete traceability on our product from seed to sale. Uh, every time we release a lot of products, we have to send that lot to a laboratory for third-party testing. And we as a company put those results uh, up on our website so anybody that purchases a product from that lot can see the actual test results. Um, in, now, I don't think we've done a very good job, uh, either Hexo or as an industry, of communicating that level of openness and transparency. Uh, I do think it's probably a function of this rush to, uh, you know, to the market and, and this, this thing that we're involved in. Um, and if I was to put a consumer lens on, I do think, I do foresee a consumer asking us for this slight level of transparency. So oddly enough, the regulatory environment that was set up to govern what it is we do is, is ready for that level of transparency. So it, I think it's from a, and I guess we're in a position to deliver we're kind of busy, but I think consumers will get us there. I would just add that we, we share those same concerns from an industry as well as from our own brand. Um, those are the things that keep us awake at night as well. So, um, you know, with having the right um, people and research, we will we'll get there. Um, the products, too, one thing we haven't talked about is the child-resistant packaging. So that is going to be something new for people when edibles do, do launch. Uh, that. Uh, all products have to be in a resealable, child-proof, so it's not tamper evidence. So everything you think about tamper evidence, throw it out of your mind. Child resistant. So child resistant is very, it, you really need a PhD to open the package. Um, so be ready for that from a, so Dr. Sylvain can open the package. I couldn't open the package. Um, but when I saw what, what we're using, I, I was like, wow, coming from the food industry, this is unique. So I think also um, for you to know is that is really important. Uh, child resistant packaging is mandated. And as an industry, we must comply. I, the one thing I would add is, is um, what needs to be underscored is, uh, is the importance of the point of sale. Uh, that experience, we talked about brands and, and the experience related to the product. Uh, Loblaw, Sobe's, uh, Shoppers, uh, Rexall, you, you name it, uh, Kushtal. I mean, they're all going to be focused on, on that point of sale. What's going to happen when the customer is looking at a product and what information is conveyed to that customer in the end? will uh, Are they going to be encouraged, educated? doesn't matter what happens. It needs to... We need to make sure that that experience is 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 positive, no matter what the outcome is. Please join me in uh, thanking the panel for the discussion.